Good day. Welcome to our program. My name is Suresh Apavu. I'm an associate professor at Dominican University of California and the School of Education. Today's program um, is a conversation with Dr. Kevin Kumashro from the University of Illinois at Chicago. We're going to be discussing his new book, The Seduction of Common Sense. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Kumashiro. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Welcome. Yeah. And um, I wanted to start off by asking you um, to talk a little bit about your new book. Yeah. Well, um, over the past few years, I've been watching some of the education reforms that have been mm -hmm. coming out, particularly to try to change or, as many would say, improve uh, public schools across mm -hmm. the country. And one of the things that I noticed is that a lot of the um, reforms coming out were coming from um, conservative groups, mm -hmm. the political right in the United States. And I was particularly concerned that a lot of these um, reforms were not only really interconnected, but also really quite successful. They were getting a lot of public support, um, they were polling very well, and they were even getting wide bipartisan support from both um, Republicans and Democratic leaders. And so this book is actually an attempt to try to explain what are some of the initiatives coming out right now um, affecting public schools, and why do a lot of these initiatives seem to be so successful? It, it seems like it's a very timely book um, where the, the climate, the uh, current state of the, the conversations about education and so on seem to be um, rising to a point of where um, Everybody is talking about education. Right. Well, particularly now in the presidential election, you right. know, every president right. wants to call themselves the education <laughs> president. Um, and I think it's particularly timely that in the year of a presidential election, we also have the reauthorization. You know, Congress is going to have to be reconsidering um, No Child Left Behind. That's what right. kinds of changes we're going to make this year, if any. Um, so I think a lot of people are talking about education, the directions we want to go, the changes we want to make. And, um, and I think it is a very timely time yeah, to come out with a book that kind of analyzes in a big way, in a big picture way, um, what's going on. So uh, what would be some of the examples from, say, the conservative uh, uh, point of view? And how uh, do you think that um, the, the more uh, liberal or the, the uh, more left, if you will, um, sort of both collaborates and opposes at the same time. Right. <clears throat> well, let me take um, the first part of your question first, sure. which is what are some initiatives from the right? Um, what I focus on are really current initiatives going on right now. Mm -hmm. So what is the right doing and have they launched in the past few years that's kind of popping up in states all over the country? And you know, some examples would be um, the privatization of schools, mm -hmm. where we hire private companies to provide what should be public services. Um, different kinds of tax measures to reduce taxing or to limit how we spend tax money around mm -hmm. education. Um, the censoring of curriculum, you know, mm -hmm. telling teachers what we can and cannot talk about in schools. Um, how we prepare teachers. Mm -hmm. There are some initiatives right now to get rid of um, requiring teachers to go through a long preparation program and say we can get you into schools and certify you to teach with just basically passing a couple of standardized tests. Mm. Um, but one example that I think is a really telling one about not only what the right is working on, but also some of their strategies, is an example called the 65% solution. Yes. So this is an initiative that's put out by an organization called First Class Education. And <clears throat> the goal was originally to have all 50 states adopt some version of this um, proposal mm -hmm. by 2008. So they haven't quite gotten there yet. but. This year, I believe over a dozen state legislatures are actually considering some version of this proposal. And it kind of works like this. Um, you know, a lot of people right now are calling for more money to be put into education. Um, a lot of groups, for example, are saying No Child Left Behind, the big federal legislation, has um, been underfunded by tens of billions of dollars since it was created. So let's say you came up to me and you said, you know, Kevin, I think we need to put more money into education. I think that's right. what's going to help improve schools. Well, what if I said back to you, actually, Suresh, I think there's enough money in education right now. We're just not spending it wisely enough. And can't you think of examples of waste? 
Um, I think that's a really smart response because a lot of us can probably think of examples of where we waste money, not only in schools, but in our organizations, in our businesses, in our households even. Um, and maybe better put how we would spend that money if we were in charge of it. Um, and if I followed up and said, where do you think most of the money should go? Um, I think many people would say, well, it shouldn't go to administrative costs. It shouldn't go to what reaches only some students. It should go to what reaches all students. And that's really what the 65% solution is about. It's about saying we sh school districts should spend no less than 65% of their budget um, on what might be called direct instruction or in the classroom spending, which is basically teacher salaries and instructional materials. Um, <clears throat> I was telling this to a good friend of mine who I think identifies with the left, and she uh, is a public school teacher and said, I think that's a great idea. Why would you oppose that? And I said, well, one of the deceptive things about this argument is that um, that money has to come from somewhere. You know, right now across the country, school districts spend about 62% of their budgets on direct in, on class, in the classroom spending. And so upping it to 65% would mean an increase of, let's say, $14 billion in a school year. In 2002, 2003, that's, a, that's what that figure would have been. But, um, <clears throat> you know, that money is not coming from outside. It's coming from other sources. So it's not <laughs> a, a, an increase in the overall budget. It's simply a redistribution of the existing budget. Exactly. And that could mean that what gets cut in the existing budget would be some very important program. So we're talking about things like food services, health services, counseling services, professional development, curriculum development, transportation, facilities, maintenance, um, even sometimes supplemental um, instructional services. So a lot of the things that target the students in most need would have to be cut. and. Um, What's surprising is that the 65% solution polls really well. Mm -hmm. um, Harris polling found that 70 to 80% of the population support 65% solution. It has bipartisan support from some Democratic leaders. And, um, and yet it actually coincided with, you know, when 65% solution was sort of coming out in the country. Um, it was around 2005 when I think it was really starting to gain some popularity. And 2005, you might remember, was a year when we had big cuts at the federal level with the defense appropriations bill in 2005. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's a bill that's not only making us comfortable with um, um, not raising money, it's actually getting us comfortable with maybe even having less money, which is some of the very arguments I think that the federal government is using with No Child Left Behind um, in some of its lawsuits as it um, struggles with um, claims that it's underfunding education. Mm -hmm. um, the federal, one of the federal government's responses is that the whole point of No Child Left Behind is to get us to be more efficient with the money that we have. Right. Right? That's why we move towards accountability systems. So I think getting people to think more critically about some of the language, and you know, it's, it's, pr it's, it's seductive, it's persuasive when you use language around efficiency and waste and reaching all students. But, um, and I think that's the strategy of the right, is it's able to frame or talk about their initiatives mm -hmm. in ways that we think just makes common sense. Right. Um, and I think that's the, ch that's the challenge of the left, is to kind of reframe that debate so that we're not so swayed by um, these kinds of messages. I mean, you, in the book, you, you refer to some um, clear frames that uh, the conservatives have uh, placed and put out and created perceptions around. Right. Um, and uh, if you can elaborate a little bit on some <coughs> of those frames yeah. and uh, really talk about the process of seduction right. that happens, of, of how the, uh, the common sense of people gets seduced by those frames right. and how they tap into, as you've pointed out eloquently in the book, um, into some of the archetypal kinds of processes that exist. Right. Well, my book is inspired in large part by a book by George Lakoff, um, yeah. who's here in Northern California, um, called Don't Think of an Elephant. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he is trying to explain the successful strategies, campaign strategies of the Republican Party, um, and how a lot of their initiatives were very attractive to voters because they were able to frame them or talk about them in ways that seemed like they reflected our core values. Mm -hmm. um, so some, I make similar arguments about education initiatives and how they're framed in a ways that seem to reflect some of our values. And some of the frames that I talk about in here would be um, like conservative notions of the family. Um, mm -hmm. 
as well as, I mean, just to, I'll list a few and then I'll talk, return to the family notion sure, um, a sure. little bit. Um, there's also um, neoliberalism, which is kind of a move towards, you know, free markets. And um, the, the term that I use here is a free enterprise and kind of how putting us into a market-like economy is a way to improve things. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people buy into this notion that if we can compete with one another, that's how we're going to get better. Right. Um, there are also notions of uh, the good nation and how we kind of mm -hmm. are the source of good against all the evils that are out there, which links in with um, notions of terrorism and particularly fear and how fear is often a way that, you know, we get uh, pressure to kind of fall in line and not raise our voices in dissent. Um, and those, I think, are some of the really powerful frames that really intersect with one another and mm. um, reinforce one another. Um, so one example uh, that you already mentioned is notions of family values that the conservative right. forces have put out. Um, this has certainly been a big thing with the Republican Party. And mm. one of the things that Lakoff has argued is that the Republicans have sort of presented a lot of their initiatives in a way that seems to look like the, a certain type of family, but at a larger scale. You know, and he calls the family the strict father family, right. where the father is sort of the leader of the household and mm -hmm. knows what's right from wrong and protects everyone from the dangers outside, but also doesn't dote on his children. Like, he doesn't right. put too much support on them. He kind of lets them fend for themselves and figure things out and, you know, kind of pull themselves up by their own boots and work hard. And I think Lakoff's argument is that Republicans have sort of put a lot of their initiatives to look like as if the government is like the father. So we should know what's right from wrong. We don't have to pay attention to other people like the United Nations. We should be able to just do things on our own. Um, we're going to protect ourselves from the many dangers outside, mm -hmm. whether it's domestically with a lot of prisons or internationally with a strong military. Um, but also, we're not going to dote on our citizens. We're not going to weaken them with things like social welfare system or an education system or universal health care. We're going to let people fend for themselves. So it's sort of like a model of <coughs> tough love, so to really, speak. Really, it really is. And I think a similar kind of model is being seen with education. And I kind of make uh, an argument that No Child Left Behind um, also has um, argue, uh, sort of reflects this kind of notion mm -hmm. of a strict father family. You know, we should know what's right from wrong and we're going to make that explicit with standards. Mm -hmm. We're going to punish people when they go wrong. Um, and that's, you know, No Child Left Behind is all about sanctions when you don't meet certain kinds of requirements every year. Um, but also there's a, a notion of protection, which I think is a really interesting way that No Child Left Behind is sometimes talked about. That sometimes people say, you know, a lot of the movement to give people choice in schools is a way of protecting you, of protecting you from schools that aren't trying hard enough or teachers who don't know what they're doing or parents who don't care enough about their children. And so let's just give them choice and let them choose where to go. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's been so hard for some people to challenge um, legislation like No Child Left Behind is, you know, the themes of standards and accountability and sanctions and choice these are really interconnected. It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like how family and you know, a strong government and the markets and um, meritocracy, how a lot of these initiatives are really tightly, tightly linked so that if you criticize one aspect of it, it doesn't always seem like you're making a lot of sense. Right. There's a, <clears throat> an interesting passage. Maybe you could uh, oh, read sure, a little yeah. bit from that. Um, that's that sort of where you, where you talk right. very specifically about that. Right, right. Um, so a selection from this book yes. is um, the four frames of standards, accountability, sanctions, and choice become linked together by a metaphor, the strict father model, that makes the four frames inseparable from one another. Um, the same is true for the frames of family, self-sufficiency, and meritocracy. These strategic framings in which several frames link inseparably help us to understand why Democrats who criticize, say, school choice, but continue to use the language of accountability, could be seen by some people to be contradictory or simply nonsensical. Um, the ability to frame the debate depends not only on the concept and the language to use that concept, but also on the means of communicating that language and on the frequency of that communication. Which means we not only, they're not only 
been, you know, the right has not only been successful at getting out really powerful messages, right. but they've yeah. gotten it out over and over so much that even the Democrats and even the people on the left start using that language. That's, a, that's a, an interesting uh, piece that you've written uh, um, very powerfully about. And so one of the questions I had was, why do you think that the, uh, the quote-unquote left has not been able to see through this or counter effectively and so on. If you can elaborate a little bit on that. Right. Well, you know, even though the book is titled How the Right Has Framed the De or subtitled How the Right Has Framed the Debate on America's Schools, half of my book is actually really quite critical of the left. Right. And I kind of argue that the left, the liberals, the progressives, whatever language we want to use, the people pushing for civil rights, are often um, failing to reframe the debate. And so the initiatives that they put forward seem to mirror in some ways what the right is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And one example, I talk about a couple of examples, but one would be um, what many organizations call closing the achievement gap. And um, the achievement gap, you know, achievement is sort of a measure of learning. And so the achievement gap is often where we look at test scores, um, right. standardized test scores across the country, and we see that some groups perform at one level, particularly white American, Asian American students, whereas other groups of color tend not to do as well. Um, black students, Latino students, Native American, Pacific Islander students. So closing the gap, bringing the scores of some up to the level of others, um, is what a lot of groups have taken on, National Education Association, National Governors Association, I mean, a lot of major national uh, groups. But the problem is, um, well, there's all kinds of problems with closing the achievement gap as a, as a goal. I mean, part of the problem is that standardized tests have been criticized for all kinds sure. of problems. But another problem is that test scores is really just like a tip of a much larger iceberg. Mm -hmm. And until we kind of are able to talk about race and racial disparities in education in a much more complex way, will we really be solving um, the problems? Right, and so you think that uh, perhaps the um, left has not produced a cohesive argument with regard to that, um, to, right. to uh, <coughs> create messages or frames, as you call them, uh, um, based on uh, Lakoff, um, that they have not created these frames that the public can really um, focus on or um, derive inspiration from or, or, or take and, and apply right. and so on. Right. I mean, I think one of the struggles with the left is to come up with some really viable alternative frames. Um, you know, I'm even thinking of some interesting legal scholarship, mm -hmm. scholarship about law that has come out recently. Like, there's another book. Um, so here I'm talking about other great books that I love. And one of them sure. is by Kenji Yoshino yeah. called Covering. Right. And in a book, this book by Yoshino, he's basically arguing that, you know, civil rights law, particularly as it gets played out in the courts, um, has this kind of... Uh, like unspoken um, demand to assimilate. It kind of actually pushes people to assimilate mm -hmm. because one of the things that it does is it seems to protect the things about ourselves that we cannot change. And what he sort of argues is, well, there's an implicit message there that if we're gonna protect only the things that we cannot change about yourselves, maybe the things that you can change, you should. And so part of what he's arguing is for a much broader way to think about civil rights and protection and what should be protected and what should we be really valuing and fighting for. And I think one of the things that I end the book with is an argument for a much broader way to think about civil rights, human rights, and what it is that we're pushing for, um, and a much broader agenda that also allows us to build stronger coalitions. You right. know, the right is really good at even though the right, as I point out here, is this incredibly diverse group of people that don't agree with each other on a lot of things, but they've been incredibly coordinated at getting messages out there that are consistent, and that are uniform, and that are persuasive. And the left, on the other hand, is often, we're good at criticizing each other. <laughs> it's much right? more fragmented. It really is. Our messages are more fragmented, our initiatives are more fragmented, and I think one of the things that we really need to do is find ways to be more coordinated, more, um, more, more, much more a coalition that can really build some powerful movement towards. Um, so, you, so you're really talking about uh, developing coalitions and operating mm -hmm. on a more slightly more long-term kinds of pieces, such as movements, as opposed to short-term bursts of. Uh, you know, cause and effect kinds of changes. Absolutely. I mean, you're even pointing to one of the big funding strategies that differs from the right and the left, where, um, again, I'm looking at 
other people's research that have sort of compared the differences between how these two political entities fund their organizations. And the right tends to fund infrastructure. They tend to fund the development of organizations, whereas the left tends to fund projects and you know more time-specific, narrow things. Well, what's going to build movement? I mean, entities that are much more connected to one another, that have more long-term impact, is arguably a way that you build movement. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So um, given that, um, what do you think um, are some suggestions or some directions for optimism um, that your book also refers to? Yeah. What, what can people do, in other right. words? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in addition to coming up with some new frames for education, I mean, I think there are some really concrete steps that we can do you know, right now, if one of the biggest challenges is that the right has really framed the, the, the debate, then I think we all have a responsibility to try to reframe that debate and to get out new ideas. Um, one thing that Lakoff has pointed out is, you know, the Republicans in the last um, Democrat mm -hmm. um, presidential election outspent the Democrats by four to one, and then they got four times as much media time, right? So right. their messages are really getting out there. And I should clarify, it's not always the case that the Republicans are the right and the Democrats are the left. I think it's much more complex than that, but sure, it's a good example. Sure, it's of, a very good point. <laughs> right. Um, but I mean, I think, so how do we get some of the new messages out there? I think there's a number of ways, and I like to think of it as, um, I was saying the other day, I'm a former math teacher, so I think visually and I think in terms of concentric circles. <laughs> so I think there's several circles at which we need to do that kind of reframing. And I, I, think, I think there's at least three. Mm -hmm. um, one is, I think, at the individual level, we all have some more homework to do. I mean, we all have more reading to do, more listening, more learning. And I want to encourage everyone to pick up a book like Seduction of Common Sense sure, or other sure. books to really start learning more. And I included have a lot more to learn. Um, what's the second circle? It would be our immediate contacts. You know, I'm thinking about how the big you know, political parties in the last presidential election spent a lot of energy on what they called house parties, where you're supposed to kind of bring together a dozen people to your home and talk about why you support a candidate or why you support a particular issue. And the, the whole reasoning there was you're going to be a lot more swayed by someone you trust than by someone knocking on your door and speaking to you for like five minutes. And I think we need to make a much more concerted effort to talk to our loved ones and our friends and our coworkers. Where uh, block parties yeah. and house parties, for example, have traditionally come from. Exactly. You know. I mean, you know, so the concept is a really persuasive one, right? I mean, it really makes a lot of sense that th they're the people that we're going to pay attention to. And I'm even thinking about when I first started writing, I didn't always want to talk to <laughs> my close friends or my sure. family because sometimes, you know, we may be on really different pages. But those are exactly the people we should be talking to. And then just really briefly, the third circle or the third area that we should be reaching out to is the broader community. Um, you know, the majority of talk radio is conservative talk radio. Um, who runs the newspapers? Who runs the television stations? We have to get our different messages out there. And I think there's a number of ways to do that. You know, writing articles for our newspaper. The mm -hmm. op-ed section continues to be one of the more widely read sections of the newspaper. We need to sure. be writing letters to the editor. We need to be writing in our school, Parent Teachers Association newsletters. Right. We need to be meeting with our lawmakers over and over again and, and sort of sharing stories of why these policies are problematic and what might be some alternatives. And maybe even getting involved in different organizations. You know, grassroots organizing has stopped some of these initiatives at the state level. Right. I, I noticed yeah. that the, you had, uh, you had uh, <coughs> mentioned several examples of how the, the mm, process toward getting some of these, like the 65% solution that you referred to, uh, was actually stopped in, in California, for exactly, example. Exactly, exactly. Um, um, and another one about teacher certification. Definitely it was a result of, in, in some part at least, in some large part I'd like to think, grassroots organizing. But grassroots organizing, you know, that's an exhausting thing. Uh, activists are burning right. out all the time. We need to build up more coalitions between the organizations. So more people need to get involved in organizing and advocacy work. And I think all of those circles and all of those ways of getting different messages out there is how we reframe the debate on America's schools. So if there was uh, one final thought that you would leave, uh, for example, California's teachers with, um, um, okay. as well as students and parents and so on, who all are sort of part of the same enterprise, uh, what, what would that be? Yeah. Um, I think my main message would be that it's not too late to act. I think sometimes we look at the coordination 
and this successfulness of a lot of the initiatives from the right, and it seems daunting. Um, but one thing that I would point out is all of the initiatives that I talked about in my book are very current. You know, initiatives that are going up in front of state legislatures mm -hmm. right now or in front of school boards right now, reauthorizing or reapproving No Child Left Behind is right now, the presidential election is right now. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can impact, and I think we have to be really committed to saying, I'm going to act, and I'm going to um, take the time to really try to uh, change the direction that America schools are going in. Wow. You know? Well, I want to thank you yeah. for taking the time to share your uh, terrific thoughts about the book. It was uh, a very eye-opening and uh, very simple, approachable, uh, and so on to, to read. Um, I want to thank all of the viewers for joining us today. Um, and on behalf of the viewers and uh, uh, Dominican University of California, um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kumashro for much. taking this time. Thank yeah. you very much.